There comes a time in every artist's life where the small flame of creation inside their heart is blown into a massive, all-consuming inferno, a moment when a wave of color floods their vision for the first time and they realize that the idea of not creating art is blasphemous, tantamount to throwing their dreams into a black hole, never to be seen again. For a lot of filmmakers, that moment of sitting in cinemas across the world on opening day of Star Wars and you hope and seeing the brilliant blue light erupt from the silver hilt of Luke's newly acquired lightsaber as John Williams' score burst from the theater speakers. For director Masaki Yuasa, that moment came from watching films with surrealist animation styles like Yellow Submarine and Fantastic Planet next to all of the Saturday morning anime he watched as a kid. Finally, for Asakusa Midori, a young girl obsessed with exploring and adventure, it was a fateful night when her parents were out of the house and the rain obscured the world outside her windows. Alone, in that gloomy atmosphere, wrapped in her comfiest blanket, she laid her eyes on Conan of the Lost Island for the first time. As its fantastical world unraveled on the screen in front of her, she found herself getting lost in its rolling green hills and azure skies the same way its protagonist did. Then, an epiphany dawned on her. Somebody created Conan of the Lost Island. Somebody created all of the anime that she watched. At that moment, Destiny thrust her life's mission onto her to create the world she always dreamed of exploring by making her own anime. This is... Keep your hands off Isuken, in love with creating art. I've watched a lot of media whose plot consists exclusively of giving the viewer a peek behind the creation of the same medium they were being told through, but none have so seamlessly blended the trifecta of imagination, passion, and realism that I've seen in Isuken. From singing in the rain through Bakuman to understanding comics, the only thing that even comes close is Fellini's Eight and a Half, and that's a masterpiece that deserves its own separate dissertation. Isuken is undoubtedly special because of the way it intertwines the aforementioned three elements into one wonderful and cohesive 12 episode narrative love letter to both its creators and the media that inspired them to become artists. As you gaze on Isuken's world for the first time, you'll immediately notice the larger-than-life quality embodied by the city of Shibahama while still feeling cozy. It's a city filled to the brim with every building and shop imaginable laid on top of each other, yet its characters never feel lost within its maze, like a wicked mix of Skyscraper 2 and Kamurocho. I've always loved bizarre architecture and media, so one single glance at the city's canal roads and haphazardly placed buildings started my love for the series from a purely visual standpoint. It's truly a feast for the eyes, but the important thing is what this wacky world is supposed to represent. Isuken isn't interested in replicating what life actually looks like. Instead, it's obsessed with replicating how life feels. Go back in time to being a kid on a hot summer's day before realizing the horrors of living under late stage capitalism. Remember the breeze, the sizzle of the sun on your skin. Remember you and your friends getting together with backpacks filled with adventuring supplies, then bravely venturing into the woods that surrounded your hometown because you were looking for the fabled secret treasure that was rumored to be buried there. It didn't feel like you were simply walking into a forest, did it? felt like you were brave adventurers embarking on a heroic journey of discovery. Maybe it wasn't that exact scenario. Maybe you climbed all over your furniture pretending to be Spider-Man. Or maybe you turned off all the lights in your house then snuck around pretending to totally be a spy. Most people scoff at the fact that they ever had such a powerful imagination, capable of shifting reality around them. But Isuken is obsessed with that sublime power. Probably because every artist, certainly this anime's creators, took that power with them into adulthood, and it serves as the fuel that pushes them to create art. When Asakusa first moves to Shibahama at the start of the series, she inspects every single passageway, hidden basement, and canal of her new metropolis-like home, documenting every last bit of it in one of her many, many field guides. As she explores, the art style shifts from traditional animation to black and white doodles. That shift means that Asakusa is laying the world she's meticulously imagined in her head over the real world she's experiencing. 
Usually, when reality starts distorting around anime characters like this, it means that they're disassociating. But not here. In Isuken, it means that Asakusa is fully jumping into the imaginary world she's created in her head, like a fabulously elaborate daydream. While Asakusa is the first character to do so, she's eventually joined by her friends as they construct dozens of beautiful worlds together. The daydream scenes are the place where Isuken shines brightest, and that's because of anime's off-the-wall golden boy, Masaki Yuasa, and his team at Science Saru. Over the years, they've cultivated a uniquely fluid and colorful house style of animation that they use to tell stories, which I can only describe as an experimental, warm hug, for lack of a more cohesive description to use. Pretty much everything they've made is just fantastic. A super neat detail about these daydream scenes is that the art style changes from the doodles you see when Asakus is a kid to a more defined technical style when she's a teenager, showing how she evolved as an artist without the need for exposition. As the traditionally animated world fades around the girls, they enter a world resembling the drawings in Asakusa and Misusaki's sketchbooks, one built out of line art and watercolors on a white canvas. The best example comes from the first episode, when Asakusa and Misusaki draw a scene together for the first time in the ramen shop. They fall into a world of rotating gears, flowing windmills, and cascading waterfalls. The coolest thing about the worlds that the girls create is that they're not static. They're fantastical, but realistic, built out of real fake machines that were clearly designed to have a purpose and not just for aesthetic values. Asakusa has to physically tighten the last few lug nuts on their dragonfly aircraft. They have to pull a lever to open the hangar door so they can leave. Misusaki and Kanamori have to use all of their strength to push the craft so that it can get enough momentum for its engines to start. When they leave the hangar, their ship stalls in midair, magnetically drawn downwards in the water because of how heavy it is. It falls, and it continues to fall, making you think that they're not destined to succeed. Then, it flies, zipping through the air with a strong heft to it, and not being able to stop on a dime because something that heavy never could. The worlds they create have an internal logic to them, always keeping the verisimilitude they established from the very first scene. When the trio reaches space, they literally see the sun dawning on their new world only for them to be returned to the real world, where it's dawned on them that they're capable of creating new worlds if they work together. Fueled by that burst of imagination, they set out to start their own animation studio, and that's where their creative journey truly begins. Everything they'd done before was just a dress rehearsal. Sadly, imagination can only get you so far. The second crucial piece that pushes artists to create is passion. Passion for art, passion for exploration, passion for life. Each of the three main characters is superhumanly passionate about achieving one goal they've held since childhood. A goal that they can only achieve together in the Isuken. Asakusa is an explorer at heart, a girl in love with the world that she inhabits, always looking to find every secret that it hides. And if she didn't find any secrets, she would create her own fantastical world to fill in the gaps. When we first see her after the intro, she's drawing on the roof of the school building, describing all the weird features of Shibahama with forensic detail. Inside her sketchbook, there's a sprawling recreation of her school with an attached forest that wouldn't look out of place in a Tales game. She views the world through an incredibly imaginative lens, with a keen eye for what seems out of place that leads to her passion for creating the greatest world imaginable through anime. Misusaki is the more typical protagonist of an anime about making anime. The girl whose parents forbid her from even holding a sketch pad, so she has to go behind their backs to pursue her dreams, only for them to accept her once they see how talented she truly is. As a kid, she saw her grandmother throw a cup of tea onto the garden and was entranced by the movement of the liquid as it sailed for the air, asking her grandma to repeat it again and again until she had its arc memorized. Right then, she fell in love with the way that things moved, making it her life's mission to capture it on paper and film. She tried to draw everything that moved, from the way she got up from her chair to how her grandma walked down the hall. As a teenager, she became the Isuken's chief animator, in charge of drawing everything that moves. Rounding out the trio is Kanamori, who isn't a character you typically see as a protagonist in media like this. 
She's the silver-tongued Yakuza light producer of the Isuken, who constantly has to wrangle the other members of their crew together so they can meet their deadline. Producers are typically a force opposite the protagonist in media about making art, because they're the ones who have to constrain the artist's unmitigated creativity within the boundaries of what's possible with the resources they have, and the Isuken does not have a lot of resources, which is why Kanamori is such an invaluable member of the team. Her shrewdness and money-conscious personality stem from working at her family's general store when she was young, then seeing it have to close down because they weren't making enough money to keep it open. That moment defined her path in life, to make fat stacks and swim in them like she's Scrooge McDuck, which very reasonable goal, personally. Each of the characters' passions is what pushes them to form the Isuken and start making anime. Asakusa and Misusaki's passion for anime specifically pops up any time they want to draw or animate a new project. The flame of creation starts burning in their hearts and they get a wild look in their eyes, then pour everything they have into their work, going over every single frame of animation to make sure it looks certified fresh. But that intense passion isn't exclusive to the main characters. Instead, it runs through every single character in the series, even if they only show up for one or two episodes. Dumeki, who's the sole member of the school's nearly defunct sound club, loves sounds. She aims to protect and expand the school's sound library until it becomes as big as the Library of Babel. The robot club loves robots so much that they've put an uncountable amount of work hours into creating their own Zaku-looking robot, complete with multiple versions and prototypes. And because this is an anime about love for anime, the club's president wants to whip like he's a Red Comet himself. Even Mr. Futimoto, who comes off as apathetic to his duties, loves teaching. I mean, what other teacher would spend every one of his off days locked in a hot car at school so that his students can follow their dreams of making anime? The more episodes you watch, the more you realize that the characters' imaginations and passions are a reflection of every person who worked on this anime. Isuken serves as a love letter not just to the medium of anime, but to everything that inspired its creators to make art. There's so many references and homages scattered throughout the series precisely because its creators wanted to show reverence and admiration to the things that they love. The anime that inspired Asakusa to create her perfect world? That's a reference to Future Boy Conan. There's a moment where Asakusa expresses that she's becoming a pro, so she's wearing a Miyazaki costume, one of the baddest dudes to ever pick up a pencil. When the girls are exploring the abandoned factory, they're all dressed up as different characters from Japanese folklore, except for Asakusa, who's dressed up as a nameless samurai from Yojimbo. Earlier in that same episode, Kanamori replicates the Akira bike slide, which anime law decreed every mid to grade piece of animation has to replicate. Also, I'm like 80% sure that the ending of their last anime is a reference to the 1996 Transformers movie, when the Autobots and the Junkoids dance together after performing the Universal Greeting for the second time after the first one failed. Wow, you just made that reference. Even some of the plot is inspired by real life moments in anime history. When the Isuken had to work up until the same convention they're supposed to present at, that actually happened to the original Gainax team, then known as Daikon Film. They had to work until the very morning of the convention they had to present at twice, for a convention they named their studio after. While the story itself is continually referential to anime history, a lot of it is naturally based on the life of creator Sumito Iwata's experiences growing up as a kid who wanted to make anime. In an interview with Live Door, Iwata discussed how they had trouble fitting in at school because of a developmental disorder, so they started drawing as a self-defense mechanism, escaping a world where they didn't fit in by creating a new one where they did. This is where the daydream scenes come from. Iwata wanted to escape his world so much that he created characters that were fully capable of escaping into fantastical worlds whenever they wanted. One of the first things you'll notice about Shibahama is that its inhabitants are incredibly diverse, with all types of skin colors and body types present on screen. In a tweet from March 2020, Owada described how their Kanagawa Elementary School was filled with people of multiple different skin tones, nationalities, and ethnicities, but that didn't change anything. They were all friends. In college, Owada studied animation in Shinjuku, where one out of eight inhabitants are foreign nationals, making it one of the most diverse wards in all of Japan. Marimoto Hashi, who was in charge of the storyboards and art direction for the first episode, told Gigazine that even though the main characters were girls, they could have just as easily been boys, so she ensured that their movements felt, quote, genderless. 
As every good piece of art does, Isuken synthesized the lived experiences of its creators and their inspirations into one chimera-like piece of art. Artists making unabashed references and homages to the things that inspired them is how they show their love for those things. Just look at Daikon 3 and 4's opening animations. But what makes the series great is how those lived experiences and inspirations connect to the original thoughts of their creators. And while Isuken clearly draws from a deep wellspring of inspiration, the original bits are equally amazing, tying everything together into one fantastical bow. But the truest test of a person's artistic passion and creativity is when it comes up against the reality of limited resources. When Asakusa and Misusaki want to spend months perfecting a single 5 second scene, Kanamori has to tell them that they don't have enough time until their deadline for that. Every artist, assuredly the ones who created this anime, faces this problem once they make a career out of their art. Sometimes it's an unexpected hiccup delaying everything, other times you simply might not have enough money to get that scene just right. There simply will never be a way for an artist to get everything just the way they want if they aim to release their art within any reasonable margin of time. While those types of problems might spell doom for some, for others it forces them to find creative solutions to their problems. One of my favorite examples of how limitations can make art better in some ways is the original ending of Neon Genesis Evangelion. Most people think that Gainax ran out of money, but what really happened was that they ran out of time for a plethora of reasons. But that lack of time made it so they had to use storyboard illustrations and watercolors to create the ending that we got. By that point, Shinji's mental state was at the edge of a very dark abyss, so the radical shift in art style made it feel like the world around him was changing in response to the terror and anxiety he was experiencing during the first impact, thus deepening the impact of those scenes. Every single anime that the Isuken creates is froth with the problems that hit animation studios, but the most impactful ones come at the start of the series, after establishing the Isuken, the girls get to work on producing their very first anime. Naturally, Asakusa and Misusaki have extremely high hopes for their first outing, only for Kanamori to realize that they were within a few weeks of their deadline and they didn't have nearly enough done. Almost all of the fourth episode consists of them using different animation tricks like looping Machete Girl's skirt flowing in the wind to be able to finish in time, but even then it was still never going to be enough. Kanamori tells them that they're going to have to do even more cutting and drop the story they had planned, then recontextualize everything. Asakusa and Misusaki protest the changes, but Kanamori responds with something that has rung true for every project ever created. The story won't matter if we can't finish it. To finish, the trio had to work day in, day out. Their intense schedule led to a tense meeting between Kanamori and an exhausted Asakusa in the computer room. <laughs> Scenes like that are why I love Isuken so much. It shows every part of the creative process with immense sentimentality, from imagining yourself lost in a world of your own creation to working yourself to death on something you know isn't your perfect vision to be able to finish in time. Even though they had to real hold that machete type back from how ambitious they originally wanted it to be, Thankfully, they were able to finish in time to present it to the student council in hopes of getting more funding for their club. As the anime starts playing, everybody in the room holds their breaths. And it's amazing! Their passion and imagination for their world bled through the screen, reaching the hearts and minds of every person in the theater, making them feel as if its world was spilling out into reality. Remember how I said Isuken doesn't care about how the world looks, but about how it feels? Everybody was left awestruck because they felt how passionate and imaginative the trio's world was. Everybody that is, except the Isuken, they were still seated, oblivious to the world around them, discussing how they could have made it even slightly better. Host of This American Life, Ira Glass, defined the disconnect between the ideas you have in your head and what you actually create as the taste gap. He argued that people who get into making art do it because they have killer taste, but the things they make rarely live up to it because they have little practical experience making art. That disappointment makes a lot of people quit before they really start, but the truth is that every single artist ever has gone through that phase, and the only way to get out of it is just to make as much art as you physically can. The more art you create, the better you'll be at making art, and the better you'll be at dealing with the limitations that get thrown your way until, eventually, you bridge the taste gap. 
there's always going to be room for improvement in pretty much everything you will ever create, whether it's an anime or a YouTube video about an anime about making anime. I'd be hard pressed to think of any artist who wouldn't go back and edit some small piece of something they created, even if people think it's a masterpiece. Just look at the amount of endings Evangelion has. But what that scene wants to emphasize is that even if you think your stuff isn't good enough to show anybody, you should still make it because your head is brimming with ideas while your body is overflowing with passion and your heart is filled with the flame of creation. Limitations, both the ones you put on yourself and those imposed on you by the world, will always be there, but you can learn to overcome them. Even if the stuff you make isn't as good as you think it should be, you should keep making stuff. That's the only way we're gonna get better at making stuff. That's what the Isukin did. That's what I'm trying to do right now with this video and all the rest I'm planning. Hey, thank you for watching this video so, 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 so much. Here's another hot vid of mine that you could watch. Drop a like and a sub if you found this video enjoyable or if it helped you get through some stuff because that's what it did for me. Uh, anyway, thank you and good night.